Hi, everyone. Welcome to LSAT Unplugged. I'm Steve Schwartz, and today I'm with Tamina Watson. How are you doing today? Hi, Steve. I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining. So I was really excited to speak with you because you do immigration law, and I work with a lot of future lawyers who are considering the field. So I'm hoping you can share some insights into what your journey has been like. Um, tell us a bit about what, what your typical day looks like. Um, well, uh, thank you so much again for having me because immigration definitely is one of the hottest topics at the moment. Um, it's uh, topping the trend charts in the news uh, because what's happening in politics definitely affects what happens in my practice on a very daily basis. Um, what does my day look like? You know, I'm a mother of two and I have a very busy practice with uh, several employees. Uh, so I do need to get into my office on time. And so once I drop off my children, I get to the office. Um, every day can be different. Um, even though the calendar might say there are, you know, several meetings uh, that are coming up, sometimes crises come up. And so the morning for me is I get into the office, I check my email, I see what needs to happen immediately. Uh, I go to my meetings depending on what's going on. And the meetings can be very, various different types. Client meetings who've never seen me before and they want to know what their options are when it comes to immigration. It could be existing clients who want to talk about their cases and want to know what the current policies are going, how the current policies are going to affect their cases. Or issues might have come up in their situations that need addressing so that their cases can process according to plan. Sometimes I go to meetings that are about uh, policy issues around the community. I do a lot of pro bono work. And in fact, 2018 was probably my, um, I, I had the most pro bono hours ever, given what's been going on in, in, the, uh, in, in the country. Um, and then, you know, cases need working uh, on. So, the days are ver varied. They are never boring because the government is always issuing new policy memos uh, that need dissecting to see which clients are going to be affected. Uh, USCIS is coming up with new uh, procedural changes, for example, and then you have to figure out which clients are going to be affected with that. Um, so, you know, often at my office, we talk about how it's never a dull day. Um, for example, a client of ours um, recently had issues about uh, filing a new potential uh, H-1B case, and we found that um, there were some challenges involved. And then we had to, we wanted to file it on a particular day, but when we found out these issues that the client didn't tell us about, we had to refile certain documents so we could then prepare the case, but then it made our week look very different because we thought that was our priority and we couldn't. So, you know, every day is different. Some of the crises that can come up are, for example, client status changing. So they have, maybe they have been fired from their jobs and they don't have much time to take the next step. Um, sometimes clients come to us with deadlines. These are clients that we haven't represented, but they have new deadlines and they want us to help them. Sometimes uh, a freak snowstorm like we're having at the moment can really uh, affect our, our cases because sometimes there are deadlines in which cases must be filed but you and USCIS must receive them. But if we haven't been able to file, then we're missing a deadline. So. You know, every day is very different. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot going on and always having to juggle competing priorities. And I'm sure you work with many different clients and so you have to balance between all of them. Just to put this in context a bit more, how exactly is current events with immigration affecting your practice specifically? Um, so I'm a business immigration lawyer, and that means my clients are businesses that are hiring employees or business men and women who are running their own businesses. And so they might need a visa for themselves or they might need visas for um, their employees. And the, who, are, who are these businesses? They could be nonprofits, um, you know, that are providing medical services. Uh, they can be schools and universities. Um, 
they can be IT companies, uh, engineering companies, uh, temples actually, temples and churches, we do a lot of those types of visas, uh, entertainment companies or companies that are hiring entertainers. Um, so it's, it's, it goes throughout the gamut. Also, um, green card through employment. So how is this administration affecting us? Uh, the president signed uh, an, uh, an executive order called Buy American, Hire American, and he signed that on April 17, 2017. And what that did, at the time it was unclear how that would affect us because the real key line in that executive order was we must hire American, um, so no, we should hire the brightest, uh, minds, I forget the actual language, brightest minds and highest paid applicants. And when you look at those to that phrase, you wonder how is that really going to change policy? So initially, I didn't know if my cases would be affected. But then came um, June, and if people don't know, uh, H1B applications are uh, something that are, is a bit like the tax lawyers uh, work um, or the tax accountants. You know, the tax uh, accountant has a deadline of April 15th. Business immigration lawyers have April 1st as a deadline because the government issues um, 65,000 visas for people with a bachelor's degree and an additional 20,000 visas for people with a master's degree for H1B visas each year. And so these applications have to be filed on April 1st. And so when this memo or executive order came out, we had already filed our H-1Bs and we only saw uh, some changes, not so much in, in, in um, regulation, but in the way gov the government was asking questions, USCIS was asking questions in their H-1B um, cases. And these questions come in a form called request for further evidence. And we started to see questions raised about wages. Is this wage the correct, correct level? And uh, that sort of started an alarm bell for most immigration lawyers. And they started to ask more and more questions, uh, digging deeper and deeper into whether a degree is necessary for this job. And what that led to was by October, people were starting to see a very high level of denials in cases. And that continued in 2018. But what we also saw is not just H-1Bs being affected, although that was one of the most affected visa categories. We started to see them in visas called L visas, E visas, um, R visas, you name it. And so this very you know, simple executive order had a profound effect in how USCIS has been adjudicating cases. We have, uh, for the first time in my practice, I saw a case being denied in an E2 category uh, for arbitrary reasons. Uh, E2 cases generally are a pleasure to work with because it's a win-win for everybody. E2s are investor visas for those who are investing in a business uh, in which they are going to create jobs and you know, boost the economy. And so the administration traditionally has liked this visa category because it's a win-win for the investor as well as the country. But we saw a denial in this uh, type of visa category for the first time for very arbitrary reasons. So what we are see seeing is that the White House is dictating that we want restrictive immigration policies and the agency is really finding ways in which to deny cases. So it's a very troubling time for everybody and it's stressful for the client, it's anxiety filled for the client and it's, that is a, a mirror image on what's going on in our practice. Wow, it's really yes. remarkable the extent to which you know, things that are, that are happening on the national and federal level could affect your personal law practice to such a great degree. I wouldn't really have expected that. And just to circle this back for those who are pre-law, haven't even gone to law school yet, I'm sure they might be wondering how, if at all, does law school prepare one for those changes? It could be a change in the immigration law or a change in tax law or whatever type of law someone's practicing. How do you, how do you feel that law school may have, have impacted or deepened your understanding of how to navigate these complex changes as they arise? You know, I'm so glad that your listeners and viewers are considering immigration. Um, law school 
is the start of becoming a professional in the industry. But keeping up with the law is something that you actually learn hands on because you don't necessarily know what's going to impact your case, your clients, until you really have those cases and clients to work on. But I'm so thrilled for your um, listeners and viewers because this is an incredible time to be an immigration lawyer. While I constantly worry and stress about my clients, I also feel very privileged to be alive at a, in a time where my skills are so incredibly important for people up and down the, the food chain of business, as well as the community. Now, one of the things that I would suggest that your uh, listeners and viewers um, pay attention to uh, are legal clinics in their schools. When the President Trump came into office, one of the first um, things that he did, and you know, it's known by everybody at this point, he signed three executive orders. One was about interior enforcement, saying we want to have security in the country, we want to make sure that, and he had several bullet points that essentially did away with all the previous priorities of deport, de deportation, the actual word is removal, um, and uh, essentially making almost anybody uh, a subject of removal. That's an immigrant, whether you have overstayed, whether you have um, uh, committed a criminal offense, whether you've been convicted or not, or if you've been, sus uh, you know, suspected of committing a crime, you know, it really leaves almost nobody out of uh, the, the line of deportation at this point. Um, and at that time, you know, that was the very first executive order he signed on the Wednesday. I think that was January 25th. And on the Friday, he signed the travel ban executive order. So what happened was people were distracted and rightly so because the travel ban was a huge problem. But as that travel ban was being in progress and people were fighting it, the executive order that was signed in the first place was slowly being executed. And that meant there were raids at workplaces, people were being picked up from roads, you know, left and right, green card holders who might have had a, a charge but not convicted, um, or even convictions, but those convictions wouldn't make them subject to deportation, were being picked up. So if you fast forward the clock, and then he uh, took away DACA, the Dreamers protection, and he took away TPS protection, and then came zero tolerance, all roads of the policies that are being put into place are leading towards immigration court. And in the immigration court world, we simply do not have enough immigration uh, lawyers to take on these cases. And so one of the things that I had done personally is um, when we lost the election, that's how I call it, November 2016, I was very fortunate to be a volunteer on Hillary Clinton's immigration working group uh, for her campaign. And I took that experience and knowing that the rhetoric for the campaign was all you know, anti-immigrant, I went to my local Immigration Lawyers Association and said, we need to be in place for whatever may come. And we were able to get a response committee in place that I was leading. And so when the travel ban was uh, signed, I already had members in my uh, committee, I was already leading this committee that helped me mobilize immigration lawyers for the travel ban and various other things that followed, including the zero tolerance. But what happened through the response committee was that I noticed and I recognized this problem that if somebody came to me and said, I need 15 immigration lawyers for immigration court, it would be very difficult for me to provide that because immigration court work can generally not be done pro bono. You can go to the airport for two hours and you know, help people. You can go to a legal clinic for two hours and provide, provide pro bono help, but you cannot take on a case, especially as a, an immigration attorney who's overwhelmed, pro bono, which will take years um, to complete. There are complex beyond belief and need a lot of time and energy. And so what I did, um, I was starting to think about how would I solve this problem 
when the time comes, because DACA had been taken away, TPS had been taken away, zero tolerance hadn't been in place quite yet, but I was seeing the future, thinking, how am I going to resolve it? And so I created, with some people, I have some colleagues, a program called the Washington Immigrant Defense Network. And uh, it essentially will, it's a nonprofit. We now have nonprofit status. And we have uh, essentially a lot of volunteers. And the model is that we will raise funds to pay a stipend to immigration lawyers. But we will group them with non-immigration lawyers who've been dying to help but don't have the skills. The, the subject matter knowledge and group them into teams and so that when we have another crisis that we will be able to have more immigration lawyers trained to be able to actually have more effective help but widen it's the short the acronym is widen will currently help the northwest immigrant detention center um, and will work with one of the local nonprofits to take cases so now coming back to your your listeners and viewers what can they do um, legal clinics are already partnering with local nonprofits to provide legal assistance in the courtroom and many other ways. And so the skills that you learn in university, uh, at college, and on these cases are invaluable in setting you apart in what you want to do in the future. Now, what you'll find, and I, I don't know, if Steve, you've heard this before, sometimes you read something in a book and in the world of academia, it sounds wonderful. It's so complex. It's so intellectual. But in practice, it may not be that way. You know, uh, maybe commercial property is a, is a good example. You know, when it comes to real estate law, you know, it can be interesting. Covenants and, you know, land rights. But in practice, it's about renewing leases. It's about, you know, uh, how are you negotiating the lease contract? It may not be as intellectually stimulating. Uh, depending on what you're doing, you know. Um, so uh, depending on what your practice is, academic teaching may not necessarily match what happens in practice. So immigration is something that people can learn from legal clinics and have hands-on experience to learn. Yes, this is something I'm very interested in. Or actually, this is not for me. It's too, it's too emotional. You know, it's too, it's too scary. So, um, Coming back to the question what they can do, legal clinics over and over again to get the hands-on experience, to find the network that you want to be in, to eventually help uh, in a very meaningful way. Wow, that's really incredible advice, Tamina. Thanks for sharing that. I work with so many pre-law students, many of them immigrants themselves, who want to go into immigration law, and it's great to know that there is a way for them to get real-world hands-on experience so that they can see whether their, their goals and aspirations match up with the reality. It sounds like with all the chaos going on since November 2016, all the changes in immigration policy, it's been a pretty, pretty wild time. And it's also very exciting and interesting to hear, maybe not for the best reasons necessarily, but there is a big demand for immigration attorneys. And so all these, you know, there's obviously been a lot of changes in the legal field in the past 10 years or so. And now we can see that while there might not be as much demand in some areas, there is plenty of demand and always seems ever more for immigration law in the U.S. So these legal clinics, I know that obviously a lot of law schools offer them, but what about for someone who might not be in law school yet? How could they get some exposure to immigration law and maybe they could work as a paralegal or something like that? That's a very good question. I think there are um, a lot of nonprofits around the country that are overwhelmed um, with the workload that they have. And they would welcome interns and volunteers. So depending on where you live, my suggestion would be that you Google the local immigration nonprofits. And so uh, you create your own list and basically start calling them saying, can I be of help? Nobody's going to say, well, most organizations likely will not say no to free help. Um, uh, the nonprofit that I have started called Widen, we're just getting off the ground. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of very enthusiastic lawyers who've been practicing for 10, 15 years, who are so incredibly generous with their time that they are helping some of the foundational issues that I'm dealing with. And so I am confident that your listeners and viewers, 
if they are proactive enough and um, assertive enough that they'll be able to find experience on the ground. And it's just not nonprofits. I mean, there are various different organizations, um, even Rotary Clubs, for example, um, uh, Chambers of Commerce. Everyone's dealing with immigration in a way that ha people have never seen before. If you go to a government office, like a, a, a city council office of some sort, maybe they have internships available because immigration is something that uh, people are dealing with at every level of society in a way that they haven't dealt with before. Because if you think about it, schools, um, you know, school, let's take school as an example. It's a sort of mini world. I used to be on a board of a, a school district um, and, a, and a committee of a board of a school district. And what I learned through being in that, on, that, on that committee is school is really a mini, mini world. And, you know, the parents are immigrants. And there are many policies in place in which green card holders, citizens, um, or mixed status families are being affected by the policies that are coming down the pike. And so a lot of people are taking their children out of the, the lunch program, for example. And so I think, you know, somebody has to sit down and think about what is it that I want to do? I want to help immigrants. So let's make a column of the nonprofits that might need my help. But what about the for-profit organizations that might need my help? Maybe I'll get a, you know, $10 an hour as an intern even. And so um, my story about pro bono, I've always been very strong in pro bono because I think the skills that we have as aspiring law students even, uh, is the willingness and determined determine um, determining um, uh, aspirations to help people uh, is such a it's, it's a strong um, deviator from everybody else so when I was about to go to law school and I sat down and thought what's going to make me set you know um, apart from everybody else and so I sat down and thought to myself what are the issues that interest me and I, I went to school in England and I thought women's issues and children's issues um, are very close to my heart and there was a summer uh, during which I worked at a school with children with disabilities and I realized that the law can help people with disabilities in a multifaceted way whether it's consumer law for disabilities education law for disabilities you name it people with disabilities need help in various functions and the work that you do become very becomes very niche you know, consumer law for disabled people is very different to niche compared to consumer law generally. And so I found organizations, just like I'm suggesting your listeners and viewers do, I did that myself. I made a list of organizations that help women, vulnerable women. I made a list of organizations that help children. And I made a, a list of organizations that help children with disability. And I actually started to volunteer at all of these organizations. And eventually, when I was at law school, I was organizing these um, uh, group seminars so that other students could get experience, hands-on experience. So I've actually done all of that th throughout law school, even before law school. Um, and then I've continued to do that to date. And I have to tell you that the, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you're doing immigration law at law school or whether you're doing real estate law at law school or housing or criminal, the skills that you learn are all transferable. How you deal with a client is going to be the same whether it's criminal law or housing law. Your bedside manner will only continue to improve. How you lead, do legal research, how you write the memo, all of these skills are going to be transferable. So it might be that some of your you, you, um, uh, pre-law um, viewers and listeners might be interested in criminal reform, criminal justice reform. They might be interested in death penalty law. They might be interested in housing law. All of these areas of law will have avenues of getting experience. And it might be that once you get that experience, you want to change your direction but those skills you learn are going to be transferable and invaluable for the rest of your life. That's a really great insight. I love how you systematically broke it down, how students can look up all the different various organizations, both nonprofit and for-profit they could consider. And then also knowing that it's transferable, that their bedside manner is a totally different skill set aside from the topic of what you're covering. It's the style in which 
you're covering it. So that's that's really valuable. I'm wondering um, to shift gears for a little for a moment. You you're a very prominent online. You're very you have a very prominent online presence. You have your podcast and your website. I'm wondering with the rise of attorneys who are hanging out their own shingles and starting their own practices, what advice might you have to someone who will in just a few years potentially be in that same position? That's a very interesting question. Um, when I first started practicing immigration law, um, you know, like everybody else, you know, I didn't know where clients would be coming from. How do I do this? And like many lawyers, I did paid advertising, whether it's Google, you know, Google search or um, paid advertising in local areas. But what's interesting is your work will speak for itself. If you do not do good work, it doesn't matter how much advertising you do because your work will speak for itself and word of mouth is a bigger advertiser than anything else. I worked in retail as a um, student. I, was, uh, I worked at a store called John Lewis in London on Oxford Street for many years. And I remember some of the trainings that we received on customer service. And the word of mouth, there was one video I remember. It, it's funny that I landed in Seattle because I didn't know Seattle was going to be my home. But one of the training videos that I watched was about the fish market here. You know, having that happy persona, making sure your clients are happy. They, while they were throwing fish around, you know, the, 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 the message was, if you're happy in what you do, it will project, you know, and it will it attract the clients. And the word of mouth, I remember a video that was shown and you know, the word of mouth, the stores are, you know, people are not gonna to come to your store. It doesn't matter what your profession is. The issue is the same. If your work is not good, it doesn't matter how much you pay to get advertising. Your work comes first, you do the good work and the rest will follow. So what happened in my, um, in my life is yes, I was doing a little bit of paid advertising, but the good work uh, and the word of it started to spread. And when clients refer you a cl another client, there's no um, higher honor than that because they trust you to tell their friends and family to help you. So my first guidance would be make sure you do a good job and care about the clients because doing the job just for the money will make sure that the, uh, the result of it is not going to be as good as you want it to be. So care about the client, do the work to the best of your uh, ability. Get mentors, make sure that you have mentors around you so that when you get stuck on something that you have somebody to reach out to. Um, you know, one of the things that had set me apart early on was writing. I, uh, I'm not a natural writer, but I had a blog and I used to stare at it thinking, oh, I know I need to have a blog, but I don't know what to write in it. But I had a, a newspaper had started in our local area and they twisted my arm in writing articles uh, for them. And so that became one of my first uh, uh, roads into writing my own articles that I also put onto my blog as they were publishing it into their newspapers. But at the same time, I was new in Seattle. I moved from London. I got married to a wonderful American man, went through the immigration process myself, and then I had to start my life all over again. So I was volunteering, just like I'm suggesting to all your listeners and viewers, I actually was volunteering in this country when I first moved, as I continue to do today. And at the time, the goal wasn't necessarily uh, to help the community in the way that I'm doing now. At the time, the goal was I need to meet people. I want to learn uh, my community, my friends, my colleagues. And what that did for me was uh, I started to take pictures at the various events and the, or the CLEs I'm organizing, the events I'm helping organize. And that became a category for my blog. What I didn't realize over time is that immigration lawyers were reading my blog too, learning about the things that I was writing about. And so what's, what I found interesting is that my trajectory into influence has really been learning my craft inside out and making sure that I do a good job. So if you ask me what my motto is in life, make sure that you care for your client, make sure you do a good job and everything else will follow. 
Well, it's an, a very inspiring example to me. And thanks, thanks for sharing that. It's remarkable, really, especially hearing how this, this, news, this newspaper article writing that you did, it, it built over time. You posted on your own website. And over time, I'm sure that every week or every month, they really build up over time. And you're the story, you're, you're sharing that immigra- other immigration attorneys are reading your articles. It's just reminding me of how I have this LSAT site and many other LSAT tutors are reading it as well. But it's a great way to network too. It's great to be connected with others in the field and, and learn from them, as you suggested, having mentors. I think is really valuable. I know, I know that one other project you have is, is a podcast about the law. And can you share a bit about that? I'm sure it would be great for listeners and viewers to hear about more about life behind the scenes. Sure. Well, thank you for asking for the podcast. I'm so proud of that. Um, again, you know, I never started my practice thinking I'm going to be on radio. I'm going to have a podcast, it's sort of naturally things were coming my way. Again, it's the good work uh, uh, and the caring that will generate uh, the next step for your life. And so a local station had started here for the South Asian community, a radio station, an AM station. And they came to me saying, hey, would you please do a radio show for us? And it was meant to be a marketing effort, so I had to pay for my airtime initially. And to me, I thought, well, I'm just an immigration lawyer. What am I going to do on radio? And I didn't really know what the true meaning of a platform is. And when they had convinced me to be on radio, I thought, well, I'll just do this for a month. You know, what have I got to lose? And by then, I had already known the movers and shakers in immigration uh, locally as well as uh, around the country, but I also knew my craft already. And what we were seeing, this was from, um, I want to say 2015 to 2017, uh, laws were, immigration reform hadn't quite happened. And the DREAM Act had, you know, hadn't passed, but there was the executive order. So issues were very different, still very, very vibrant, but different, you know, pre-Trump. And so the, the, when the radio show had started, I went into it a little bit scared, thinking, what am I doing? This is so outside my comfort zone. And I, and I will tell you, talking about comfort zone, I remember somebody showing me um, some sort of graph where, you know, there's the circle here where your comfort zone is. And then, you know, there is this little thing out here where you're completely out of your comfort zone. And then you have to grow into it. And the radio show was definitely like that for me because I went into it very scared and anxious thinking, I don't know how to speak on radio. Nobody's going to see my face. But what I learned was I love radio. The reach I had through radio made me inform people and educate people in a way I couldn't have done otherwise. So the news uh, updates that I was doing on my blog certainly had a new amplification at that point. And so um, when I was thinking about how to do my radio show, it was about news updates and it was about interviewing people who were either making a difference in immigration or were notable immigrants themselves. And that's, that's actually my tagline for my show. And, you know, it's been a, a very rewarding experience for me because uh, the show enabled me to reach out to people that I didn't even know. Uh, actually, they didn't know me, perhaps. And they were very willing to be on my radio show. So I had the radio show for two years. And I absolutely loved it. It was one of the biggest parts of my week that I looked forward to. But the station actually had to sell. It sold to a different owner. And when the radio station sold to a different owner, I, I didn't quite have the same experience with the new station. And so it then turned into a podcast. And so now I have a podcast on iTunes, which was very cool. Um, I had to hire people to help me fix it and make it look like a podcast mm-hmm. because I'm not savvy Um, and what's interesting is the podcast has really taken a different shape you know on the radio uh, and you probably know this Steve when you have your own podcast you're the producer the director and everything but I was very spoiled going to a very professional radio station where everybody would click buttons and move buttons up and down and give me a lovely little mp3 and that was my radio show um, that I could put onto SoundCloud 
but it's not quite the same when you have your podcast. So um, I do have a podcast. We have shows that are not as frequent as we had it before. Um, but I have also teamed up with a local newspaper called Seattle Globalist. And it's a very prominent news uh, publication here. And so I've teamed up with the founder of, of that particular publication. And the last few podcasts have been uh, a joint um, you know, co-hosting um, you know, series. And so it, it is very informative still. I encourage people to sign up because the news that will be coming out on the podcast in the next few weeks will be very um, informative, particularly for your listeners and viewers who are immigration, I mean, sorry, immigrants themselves. Because what is happening with this administration is that every category of immigrant is being affected. So, for example, students who are in the U.S. on student via visas have very specific issues to worry about than the work visa holder whose visa might not be renewed. And so I would encourage your podcast listeners to tune into, to, uh, uh, it's called Tamina Talks Immigration. And in fact, I'm very lucky I recently got it, uh, a trademark registration for it. Uh, so that feels very exciting. And if they can please sign up, they'll get the updates as and when they come out. Excellent. I'm really glad you brought in that angle about how students could be affected directly. That's definitely important information for them to get. So it's Tamina Talks Immigration, and it's on iTunes. More episodes coming out soon. Well, Tamina, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining and sharing advice for listeners and viewers out there. Um, anything you want to share before we sign off? Well, first of all, Steve, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been very interesting. And one of the things that I uh, really um, take pleasure in is to talk to students about what the future looks like as a lawyer. And I think what I will leave your, your listeners and viewers with is be open to evolving as opportunities come your way. You might think you want to be a lawyer in one specific um, subject matter, but life will bring different roads and forks in the paths that if you're not open to you, to you might close them. And what I will finally leave you with is your motto as a lawyer should be really to help people. The money will follow, the reputation will follow. Keep in mind that if you do a good job, that is what the lawyer's perspective should be. Very wise words, Tamina. Thanks so much for sharing those. Until next time. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye.